Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Come and have your way. Lord, give us sensitivity to your leading. And may everything that we do today be according to your will and your leading. Nothing more and nothing less. So thank you again. Lord, keep us safe from the enemy, the world, and from ourselves. And may your spirit alone rule and reign in our hearts and lives in this place today as we seek your face. And we pray all of it in Jesus' awesome and matchless name. Amen. Amen. You guys can stand if you'd like to or remain seated. The main thing is always the attitude of our hearts. Let's worship spirit and truth. Let's lift him up. Lord, just meet us here. Have your way, God. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in on wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You'd lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see for All that you've done for me Oh, 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 Who brings our chaos back into order Son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see all that you've done for me. We sing of all that you've done, Lord. And behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, God. We just sing because you're worthy, Lord. Let's lift him up this morning, church. Let's sing it. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing. That you would take my place, thank you, Lord. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I see for all that you've done for me. Oh. Thank you for your grace and mercy, God. 
lift you up, Jesus. Come and have your way. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. Oh, praise his name, church. Jesus, you're worthy. You can clap. God's worthy of all praise. Amen. Lord, just continue to have your way as we seek your face, as we worship. We lift up the mighty and matchless name of Jesus.
there's no one like you, Jesus. Just close your eyes. Let's quiet ourselves for a moment. Just let the Lord speak to our hearts and to draw us into his presence. Just uh, let's let him have his way in this moment of silence with our hearts open, our eyes closed. Let God speak to you. how you love us, Jesus. Father, thank you that you are just that. You're a father to us. A good, good father that loves, protects, provides. And Lord, we can never thank you enough. All we can do is sing your praises and give our lives back to you as, as living sacrifices, Jesus. Pour out your spirit.
you for your presence here this morning. Lord, we know that you're here. Your word does declare that you inhabit the praises of your people. That you draw near to the heart when it draws near to you, God. And we know you're here. Lord, you know each of our hearts, you know right where we're at in relation to what our relationship is with you. Lord, you know the hearts this morning, they're yours that have become new creations in Christ. Lord, and if you know if there's somebody here today that just not in that place yet where they have not become part of your family, that they haven't been, as you said, Jesus born again. I just pray you stir every heart, draw us to you, God, and may your will be done in each heart and each life as we just continue before your throne of grace. Lord, we thank you that as we enter to this time of devotion and prayer as Bill comes, Lord, that we can just continue before you, Lord, with worshipful attitudes and hearts just seeking your face. Lord, we pray that uh, this devotion would be uplifting, encouraging, uh, challenging perhaps. Lord, it would be what we need to hear in this time. And Lord, I pray that as we enter into the prayer time, that Bill would pray, again, only according to your will. And we always ask that, God, because that's all that matters, is your will in all things. So continue to direct us as we continue to focus on you, Jesus. It's in your awesome and mighty name that we pray. You guys can be seated for our devotion and prayer time. Good morning. Enjoying the snow? No? We, well, you know, it's getting close to Resurrection Sunday, so maybe this is a sign that we are being cleaned as white as snow by the blood of Jesus. What are you laughing about? You know, over the past several months, my wife and I have been uh, reading a lot, listening to a lot of uh, one of the main guys we've been listening to is Amir uh, on a lot of it is prophecy update, but more than anything, it's world news and a lot of things that are happening in the world that relate to the Bible. You know, the times are coming and the uh, one of the things the other day that he alleviated to was uh, the economy and the prosperity of the United States right now. And it seems kind of ironic that things are going so well right now. Uh, maybe it's because God is in the White House again. You know, so just a food for thought. But one of the things that... Uh, 
that was impressed on me is is the lack of a lot of things in the world right now and one of them is compassion there's really not much compassion in the world right now there's a lot of hatred so compassion is a feeling of wanting to help someone sympathetic consciousness of others distress together with a desire to alleviate it literally a feeling with and for others is a fundamental and distinctive quality of the biblical concept of God. In Jesus Christ, in whom God was manifested in the flesh, compassion was an outstanding feature. Matthew 9.36 says, But seeing the crowds, he was moved with compassion, because they were tired and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. In Matthew 14.14, 14, and Jesus went out and saw a crowd, and he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. A little explanation of those two verses. When that happened, well, Jesus had just heard about the death of his cousin John the Baptist, and he headed out across the Sea of Galilee to get some privacy and rest. But thousands of people followed him. It would have been easy for Jesus to be irritated and frustrated, but Jesus was moved with compassion even in the midst of his own sorrow. What an example that is to all of us. He moved with compassion literally means to have one's inner being stirred. It is stronger than sympathy. The word compassion is used 12 times in the gospel. And eight references are to Jesus Christ. And if our Heavenly Father had such compassion towards us, should we not have compassion toward others? And Jesus taught that it ought to be extended not to friends and neighbors only, but to all without exception, even to enemies, which at times is hard. Romans 9.15 for God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. If God only acted on the basis of righteousness, nobody would ever be saved. Paul quoted Exodus 33:19 to show God's mercy and compassion are extended according to God's will and not man's will. Exodus 33:19. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name Yahweh before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I show, will show compassion to anyone I choose. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you so that you may become sons of our Father in heaven. For he made his son, S-U-N, to rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the just and unjust. Where in scripture does it say hate your neighbor or hate your enemies? It doesn't. This love is a mark of maturity proving that we are sons of the Father and not just little children. It is God-like. The Father shares his good things with those who oppose him. Matthew 5.45 suggests that our love creates a climate of blessings and compassion that makes it easy to win our enemies and make them our friends. Love is like the sunshine and rain that the Father sends graciously is a testimony to others. As Christians, we must return good for evil as an investment of love. The God of the New Testament, the Father of men, is most clearly revealed as a God full of compassion. It extends to the whole human race for which he affected, not merely in temporal, but a spiritual and eternal deliverance and giving up <coughs> an eternal deliverer since giving up his own son to the death on the cross in order to save us from the worst bondage of sin 
with its consequences, seeking thereby to gain a new wider people for himself, still more devoted and filled with and expressive of his own spirit. Therefore, all who know the God and Father of Christ and who call themselves his children must necessarily cultivate passion and love and show mercy even as he is merciful. Lamentations 3.22 The faithful Lord, love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease because his compassions fail not. And Lamentations 3.32 Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. The Lord doesn't cast off his people and forget them. In the midst of pain, we know he loves us. God doesn't enjoy chastening his children, and he feels the pain. But always, <coughs> excuse me, but always remember, God is on the throne and in control of all compassion let us pray father we just come before you right now father and give thanks for this time of worship for this place where we worship for those who gather here to worship you father we pray that we can be humble and compassionate in our daily lives and our daily walk we pray for the world father compassion and love are very lacking right now father and we just need that not only in our country but in the world we know that you are on the throne we know that you are in control and we just pray father and look forward to your coming we thank you for your amazing grace that you so freely give we thank you for being with us we thank you for, for, for providing for us Maybe not what we want, but you will always provide what we need. We pray, Father, for our leadership in this country, in Washington, in the state, in our local communities, Father. We pray that you will be a very, very powerful influence upon them and the messages that they give and the decisions that they make. We thank you for our firefighters, our military, our first responders who go out daily, Father, protecting the peace so that we might have the freedoms that we have, so that we might come and worship you and praise you. We pray for those who are not with us today, Father, because of travel or sickness or whatever. We just lift them up to you, Father, and pray that you will be with them and bring them back to us soon. We pray, Father, for Pastor Phil as he delivers a message, Father, that his words will be your words. And above all, Father, we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. We give it all to you, Father. We lay it at the foot of the cross. And we pray in Jesus' most precious and awesome name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Very appropriate devotional Certainly something that the world is lacking, right, is, is true compassion that can only come from the heart of God because God is love and we're talking about ecumenical things. We're just talking about the reality of who he is. And uh, before we get into our announcements, just want to talk about that just for a moment again. We're in the fourth part of a prophecy update and typically we work verse by verse through a book of the Bible and we've taken just a bit of a detour uh, doing this prophecy update and of course the next couple Sundays will be related to the resurrection season. And again, there's so many things happening in the world today fulfilling Bible prophecy. And as Paul, you know, told Timothy and warned that in the last days, the people would be uh, lovers of self, lovers of money. You go down the list, and again, this, everything is so self-centered and cold that the love of people would grow cold towards God and humanity. And it even talks about people being brutal. It's amazing to see in the world today, right, man's inhumanity to man. So when he talks about compassion, that can only come from God. And if we have compassion, we want to see people know Jesus as we know him and have a relationship with him as well. And as the world changes, as things are getting, uh, I guess from some perspectives, worse, the reality is, is the light of Jesus shines brighter in an ever-darkening world. So it's an opportunity for the love and the light of Jesus to shine through his people where we find ourselves, right? 
So just keep that in mind, and uh, I'll touch on that a little bit more when we get into our prophecy update. But again, some quick announcements. It's very, very important. Scott, if you can give me my computer, I'd appreciate that, my friend. Just some upcoming stuff. Uh, folks, we're two weeks away from today, from Resurrection Sunday. Isn't that hard to believe? Uh, we'll be celebrating that two weeks from today, and we're not doing the conference center. We had shared that with you guys about a month ago. Felt compelled just to have our services right here, the 9 and the 10 o'clock. There'll be family services, and so keep that in mind. We're hoping that we can get some of you guys to come to the 9 o'clock this time because, uh, of course, uh, very people are very thoughtful about... Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> So that's all the kids? Just on their phones? Okay, cool. So uh, they had issues with the printer, so if you need to check your kids in via your phone app uh, for Kid Check, then do that. That'd be wonderful because, you know, it's great to have these tools and resources, but you know what? Sometimes there are also uh, hiccups and glitches. So if you need to uh, check your kids in and you didn't have a chance to do that, please use your phone app to do that as well. So anyway, two weeks from today, Resurrection Sunday. By the way, as we lead up to that, next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, right, which is a an amazing time in the life of Jesus as he presents himself as he rides in to Jerusalem. We're going to look at the biblical text and the relevance of that. And it's an amazing thing because as he rides into Jerusalem, they're shouting, Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're declaring that he's Messiah. But four days later, the majority of those people would change their tune and shout, crucify him. So we're going to look at the significance of that next week, and it's very, very important. And of course, uh, Next Sunday, after we get through that, that whole week is just a, an amazing journey from the time of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. We'll celebrate again Palm Sunday. Then on Thursday, folks, we have our traditional Passover Seder. And we don't do this because we're not trying to be Jewish, but every year we've done this for years and years. It's going to be on Thursday night, the 29th at 630. The whole point of doing this is every element points to Jesus. And the fact of the matter is that Jesus is the Passover lamb. That's what Paul the Apostle would say. John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So folks, we do it because it's all about Jesus. We have a fellowship dinner at 630. Great time of fellowship. We're anticipating a couple hundred people. So there are sign-up sheets out in the foyer relating to food items for that so we can have all those things covered. So prayerfully think about that, about providing, and it always works out. It's fantastic. And then, of course, that'll start at 6.30. We'll have dinner first, then that'll take us through the Passover Seder that just celebrates and lifts up Jesus. It's really, really good stuff. Then, of course, again, Resurrection Sunday, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Again, pray about coming to the 9 o'clock. If you come to the 11 o'clock sometimes, please come to the 9 o'clock so we can spread that out, confident that it's all going to work out in a good way. By the way, as part of our celebration, we're going to have baptisms. That's one of the reasons we felt compelled to do it here and not at the conference center is because we can't do baptisms there. We can't take communion there. So we're having it here. And uh, if you have not been baptized or, or done what's called believer's baptism, that's a public proclamation of your faith in Jesus. If you've accepted Christ, you've, you've become a child of God, you've been born again, okay, and you know that you have eternal life, but you haven't been baptized in water, what that is, it's an identification with Jesus', Jesus death and resurrection. And God honors it when we do that. So can you think of a better day if you haven't done that before than to do it on a Resurrection Sunday? There's a sign-up sheet for that out there. I've had several people approach me on that. So folks, please uh, sign up. Uh, indicate which service you want to do it in because we'll have the baptisms as part of both the 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. Leave your phone number and your age, and I'll follow up with you guys on that. But man, what a great way because Resurrection Sunday is a celebration of the reality that Jesus Christ is alive. That's not a fairy tale. It's real. He's real. And the evidences for that are overwhelming. So it's going to be an amazing week starting next week. By the way, so that you understand this, that Wednesday then, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, there won't be any midweek service for youth or for adults because that Thursday we're going to have the Passover Seder, okay? So keep that in mind. The following week we'll be back on track with our regularly scheduled stuff, of course. I believe all of our Calvary Connection small groups Sundays through the remainder of the week are still in play this week as well. So is that correct? Essential Christianity Tuesday nights, Roman study, Sunday nights, uh, women's study, 9.30 Monday mornings. I believe that's still on. Oh, women's study Thursday night, of course, they won't be, won't be having that because we'll have the Seder. So any of you ladies who attend the Thursday night women's study, just know that. And again, by the way, the Believer's Baptism sign-up sheet looks just like that. It's out there where Garrett's at. Speaking of Garrett, he's one of our youth group leaders. Uh, him and Chelsea Woodbury lead our middle school and junior high. 
And this coming Wednesday, he's going to launch, and he's done this before, but it's a youth worship study. So if there are some of our youth, 6th grade through 12th grade, that would like to get involved with worship ministry, you feel compelled in that area, then come. He's going to lead you in a study and help equip people for leading worship. That's an exciting thing. So starting this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, running up to just before we have our worship time with our youth and adults, and then go into our, our studies on Wednesday nights. Then also, Garrett's hosting this Saturday, this coming Saturday, at his house from 10 o'clock in the morning till noon, uh, a breakfast, a youth breakfast, 6th graders again through 12th grade. Out in the foyer, again, a sign-up sheet for food items. It looks like a lot of our youth have signed in on those, so if there's an area that we still need some more, then check that out, and it's always a, a lot of fun going to Garrett's house. Now, he's saying he hopes he can keep it around 30 because his house will get packed. I say it needs to be double that. Who thinks that needs to be double that, right? <laughs> So we're praying, Gareth, that there's 60 of our youth there. That'd be awesome. So did I miss anything? We good? All right, we're good on that. So I think we've covered all of our bases. And with that, we're going to dismiss our middle school and our junior high kids, our fourth and fifth grade class. You guys are welcome to go back to your areas. Good to see all these uh, young people heading back to their study areas to get into God's Word, to meet them right where they're at. And folks, to begin our, uh, our fourth and final prophecy update in this segment, what we're doing right now. I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 8. Everybody open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And it was interesting because in the first service, the Lord just impressed on me during the prayer and devotional time to start our service out with this. I hadn't planned on it, but I think it's very, very fitting and appropriate, especially in light of what Bill was talking about, about compassion. Authentic compassion can only be something that comes from a God who himself is love and compassionate, right? If we know Jesus and we love him, it's because he loved us first. And when he reached out to us and everything he's done for us, again, and that's not religion, right? That's relationship. The world's filled with religion. Biblical Christianity is relationship with the God who loved us so much that he came and became one of us and then offered his life up on the cross for us. And so if we're going to demonstrate Authentic compassion has to come from God, flow into hearts and our lives, and flow from us to those around us, folks. And that's so, so critical because in a darkening world, the light of Christ shines brightest when the love and the compassion of God is flowing. So Paul the Apostle, almost 2,000 years ago, as he was sharing this information, this letter to the church at Rome, he felt compelled to uh, share some very powerful things. In fact, uh, actually, it's Romans 13. That's where I meant to go. I knew when I looked at that, I thought, no, wait a minute. It's that 5.30 wake-up of mine, right, that's catching up to me. And I'm getting old-er, heavy on the er, right, older. <laughs> at least my wife's not here this morning to mock me. <laughs> so we pick it up in chapter 13 and verse 8. That's where the 8 comes in. It's verse 8 of Romans 13. Now, again, this is so powerful. Listen to this. Paul said, oh, no one anything except to love one another. And that's the highest form of love, agape, selfless, sacrificial. So isn't that amazing? Oh, no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now Jesus said in Matthew 22, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, are always trying to trip him up, right, because they wanted to kill him. So there was a situation where they're asking him questions, and a scribe says, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus refers back to what's called the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. And he said, here's the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, basically with all that's within you. The second commandment is to love your neighbor. Love people as you love yourself. Jesus said, on all the law of prophets depend on these two commandments, that if you're loving God with your whole heart, and you have that authentic relationship with Him, and you're spending time with Him, He transforms us, and He gives us a love for those around us. If we have a love for those around us, then we're not going to sin against those around us. We're not going to sin against God. We're not going to sin against those people. We're not going to hurt them. Now, are we perfect? No. We're a work in progress until we get home, right? At the point we're born again and saved, we have eternal life. Our spirits are redeemed, and we know that we have that eternal reality before us. But until we check out, and we step into eternity, we're still a work in progress, right? And I don't know about you, but I have my days. <laughs> I have my days that are pretty good days, and I have my days where uh, uh, my wife says, man, you, you act like an old man sometimes. <laughs> That's it. Wow, thanks, dear. So, wow, you know. <laughs> so I need to spend more time with the Lord, right? And we just want Him to shine His love through us. So that's what He says. Look, to love, and look what it says in verse 9. For the commandments, by the way, there were 613 
commandments in the Old Testament. There's the top ten, right? They're called the Ten Commandments. How many have lived out the top ten commandments? Anybody by show of hands in this room? How many of us have broken some of the top ten? Do you think we can live all of them? Absolutely not. The whole point is that none of us can. Nobody can fulfill the law. That's why Jesus came to die in our place and then to give his righteousness to us when we accept him. But look what it says for the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. That's a good commandment. You shall not murder. That's a good commandment. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Sounds a lot like what Jesus said, right? Where do you think Paul got it? Now look what it says in verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So talking about compassion, talking about being the heart and the hands and the feet of Jesus, the more time we spend with God, the more that we see that borne out in us, that we have a love and a compassion for those around us. And folks, there are plenty of people who need the love and the compassion of Jesus shown through his people, amen? A lot of people who need to know that the Lord loves them, that know, need to know that this is not a religious thing. Having a relationship with God is so important. And it's the only way to have eternal life. So in light of that, folks, and now as we embark into our prophecy update portion about it, look what he says in verse 11 through the remaining portion of this chapter. And folks, remember this is almost 2,000 years ago. And by the way, we've been in the last days, technically, since the time that Jesus came upon the scene. But we're living in the very last of the last days because all the prophecies being fulfilled in our day. It's amazing. So Paul warned them almost 2,000 years ago, and keep this in mind, if it was relevant then, certainly relevant now. And he said, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. How many Christians are asleep? You can sleepwalk, right? You can talk in your sleep. There are plenty of Christians that are asleep, have no idea of the day and hour that we live in prophetically. They know the world's rapidly changing, as does the world. But folks, Christians need to be awake. And he said that's what needs to happen even back then. To wake out of sleep, for now your, or our salvation, by the way, that's not redemption, being born again. That's talking about God catching us up to escape the coming judgment upon the world that will happen during the tribulation period. That's what he's talking about. To awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Keep in mind again, this is relevant then and the day and age that we're living in. On borrowed time, folks, it's more relevant now than ever. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. How critical is that? Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, nor in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that, you know. We put on our jackets. This morning we probably put our jackets when we came out. It's kind of a metaphor. But put on Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. That means your old sin nature to fulfill its demands for what it wants right now. That's what our old sin nature wants. It's self-centered and focused. But if we put on Jesus and we understand the hour of the day that we're living in, then that's going to move us to want to be faithful to live for God and to seek Him heartily now. Amen? So with that, folks, I want to take us into uh, our prophecy update. This is the final portion of this. So if you can, oh, you, thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Folks, this is the epicenter of history and history in advance, the future, folks. This is a shot, of course. You've all seen this picture of the Temple Mount in Israel, in Jerusalem. I took this from uh, across from the Mount of Olives. And for those who are going with us in 2019, so a year from now, uh, again, it's surreal to be in all these locations, to see these places that history was born out thousands of years ago. By the way, remember 27, 28 percent of the Bible is prophecy. God telling us in advance what's going to happen. Half of those prophecies have been fulfilled. All the prophecies relating to Jesus' first coming have been fulfilled, every detail. And there are more prophecies about Jesus' second coming, not the rapture, the second coming to establish his kingdom on earth than there were about his first coming. So that's important stuff, right? And here's the reality. Someday in the future, Jesus will rule and reign from a temple on the Temple Mount to fulfill the Davidic covenant, the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel. And that is not a fairy tale. The world is being prepared for that. Antichrist is trying to uh, throw a monkey wrench in the works. Imagine that. That's what he's trying to do. The enemy's always tried to do that, right? He started back in Genesis by deception. And we've talked about that the first two times, our Sundays in our prophecy update. But folks, it's all going to culminate with this small piece of real estate that the world is fixated on and it doesn't make sense. 
So as we jump into the prophecy update, quickly, some of these critical things we find from God's Word. Jesus talking to the religious leaders again in His time. He said, you guys can tell what the weather's going to be like. You look at the sky and you know it's going to rain or it's not. It's going to be nice or not. But He says, you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. We as Christians should be aware of the day and age that we're living in. And so much of what's happening in the world today are clear things pointing to the reality of Jesus' return, just like he said it would be. Now, you've got to be balanced. You don't want to be overly sensational. But again, folks, things are happening so quickly, it's staggering. Remember, Jesus himself said it would be like a woman who's pregnant. And when she's about to give birth, ladies, you know what that's like if you've had kids. The birth pains increase in frequency and intensity until ultimately there's a birth. And folks, the frequency and intensity of the birth pains are ramping up. That's what we're seeing. It's incredible. Remember the principle from Isaiah 46.10 as God shares this reality. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. Why? Because God's outside of time and space. He knows it all. And from ancient times, things which have not been done saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Remember, again, there's no other book of any religious thing. Again, biblical Christianity is not a religion. It's about God's love for us. That's what it's about. It's relationship-centered, right, with the Lord God. But there's not another book, holy book, of any other faith system that has prophecy. Why? Because it's not from God. Only prophecy could come from God because He tells us in advance what's going to happen, and it happens. That validates and verifies the message and the messenger. Keep in mind, again, half of all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled with every detail, every I dotted, every T crossed. It's a witness, right, to the world. Keeping that in mind, Revelation 19.10, that the essence of prophecy is to do what? Give a clear witness for Jesus. Folks, I can't tell you how strongly, time and time again, the importance of us understanding some things about Bible prophecy because it's to point people to Jesus and the reality that there is a God, He's the God of the Bible, and He's in control. And He can gain eternal, eternal life by knowing Him because that's what matters at the end of the day. So I ask you guys, do you understand? Do we understand the day that we live in? Back in David's time, there were men from the tribe of Issachar, leaders, who supported David. And it says this, All these men understood the signs of the times, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. So as Christians, we should know the signs of the times, know the best course for us to take as Christians, for ourselves personally, for our families, for our church family, right, for the body of Christ in this community, prayerfully. So it's all relevant, it's all important. And you know what's staggering to me? 80% of the church in the country and worldwide give no credence to Bible prophecy or very little. They say it's irrelevant because they don't believe it. Isn't that staggering? With all the prophecies that have been fulfilled, all the things that are ramping up before our very eyes, I believe the enemy has blinded them to the significance of what's going on because there's no urgency in the lives of those people. By the way, most of those people involved in those denominations or those religious movements also believe in what's called replacement theology. They believe because Israel initially rejected Jesus as Messiah that they forfeited any, pro any promises of God and that the church has replaced Israel and God has finished with Israel. Uh-uh. <laughs> Are you kidding? you got big problems with Israel being restored as a nation again in 1948. That's one of the key prophecies in the last days. Remember, Israel was scattered as a nation. The temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., every stone of the temple torn down. In 135 A.D., the final revolt of the Jewish people with an uprising against the Romans was put down, and the nation of Israel ceased to exist for almost 2,000 years. Prophecies relating to that are all over the, New Testament, or the Old Testament. And on May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation again, folks. That is so critical. May 14, 1948, by the way, what is May 14 this year, 2018? 70th anniversary, that significant, folks. And with what's going on in our country with a new president, a new administration that is a friend of Israel, uh, it's kind of thrown a monkey wrench. Well, not kind of, it's really thrown a monkey wrench into how the world views things because we have a president, and I believe he was inspired by God to say, you know, a couple of months ago that we recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And you know what? The world was up in arms. What? You can't do that? Why does the world care? Do you care what the capital is of Germany or France or England? Do you think they care about what the capital is of America? Not really. So why are people freaking out that we've basically said, hey, we understand that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, yet the world is freaking out? Again, folks, because there's something that's above and beyond. It's a spiritual reality. 
that little piece of real estate has been something the enemy's been battling over with God for centuries, right? That's the scope and the focus of the world. Why? Because it's spiritual in nature. It's an amazing thing. Prophecies from Ezekiel, as you see there, and Isaiah and Amos, and those are just some of them, were prophecies about Israel being scattered. It was scattered for almost 2,000 years and then regathered, became a nation again. That's never happened. No nation has been scattered for a few hundred years, let alone almost two centuries, I mean 2,000 years, and then regathered. Fulfillment of prophecy. And on May 14, 1948, here's something that's amazing too, folks, by the way. Israel today is one of the strongest, most prosperous nations in the world. Technologically, they're one of the leaders. They've got one of the greatest militaries in the world. A population of a little over 8 million people is all, with enemies on their borders who hate them and want to destroy them and eradicate them. But folks, they're confident. They're doing well. They've been blessed. And even back in 1948, on May 14th, when Israel declared it was a nation again, Isaiah prophesied that it would become a nation again in one day. That's exactly what happened. Within 24 hours, five Islamic Arab nations attacked Israel. This little fledgling nation with just thousands of people and these huge Islamic nations attacked Israel and they lost. Isn't that incredible? overwhelming odds that make no sense to the world how Israel survived, but God was with them. Happened time and time again. 67 war, it happened again. The 73 Yom Kippur war again. Again, those surrounding nations tried to destroy Israel with tanks and all their stuff. I've, I've read headlines, folks, from back in that day and age where the Arabs and some of the Muslim people are saying, we don't get it because their God has protected them because we fired shells, we fired mortars, we fired our, our tanks into Israel, and our mortars wound up behind us. We can't explain it except it must be their God protecting them. Those were headlines. There was a guy I met years ago. His name was Yishael alone. He was a, a colonel in the Israeli army. He was part of both of those wars. And I remember him sharing with us at a meeting I was at. And he said there was footage that they have of this, of some of the Israeli soldiers taking direct hits and nothing happening to them. That's supernatural, folks. That's supernatural. Just like tanks launching missiles or, you know, the projectiles into Israel from the Golan Heights and they wind up behind them. What's that about? Naturally, that doesn't make sense. God has preserved and protected Israel. Here's the reality. We're living in a day and age where that's being ramped up. There are two conflicts looming that are coming up. One is the Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario where a coalition of nations led by Russia will try to attack Israel. The stage setting for this is unbelievable what's going on with that, folks. In the north above Israel and Syria where Russia has a presence, where Turkey has a presence, where Iran has a presence, all three of those nations are major players. We're going to see today about Ezekiel 38, the prophecies, again, 2,500 years ago about all this stuff. And then there's a final battle, you've probably heard of it before, called Armageddon in the Valley of Megiddo at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Folks, those are two major things that preparations are well underway of. Keep in mind, again, Israel, a nation again, a primary and foundational end times prophecy. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 32 to the disciples, he said, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, know that summer is near, right? We're moving into spring. We see signs of that. We're moving into summer. We know. So he uses that metaphor. But here's the reality. Biblically, the fig tree speaks of Israel. It represents Israel symbolically. So he's talking about Israel being regathered. And here's the reality. Israel is God's timepiece. As you look at the, the biblical message and prophecy, the heart of it is Israel again. If you look at a clock, folks, the nation would be likened to the hour hand, okay? Jerusalem itself would be likened to a minute hand, and the Temple Mount, that's the focal point, that's the epicenter, is likened to a second hand. And folks, the whole world is fixated on this little bitty piece of real estate. I'm going to give you the bigger shot so that you understand the scope of this. Here's Israel, folks. The white is the West Bank under Palestinian occupation. And then over here we have uh, the Gaza Strip as well. Folks, when you're in Israel, it's amazing, the proximity to places. When you're on the Mount of Olives, it's amazing how quickly you can walk across the Kidron Valley and up to the Temple Mount. You see how quickly they got from places. But even today, 150 miles wide at its widest point, you can drive top to bottom in about six hours. Look at the size of these other nations around here. Most of these nations are part of the prophesied coalition that are staging right now in Syria 
to attack Israel. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I want to mention something before we move on. There are nations not listed that you'll see that are not listed in the Ezekiel 38 scenario that are Egypt and also Saudi Arabia specifically. Folks, right now Israel's on pretty good terms with those guys in Jordan. Now, the make no mistake, they're, the majority of their population are Arabic and they're Islam, Islamic. But right now, Israel has been working with Egypt to destroy ISIS and because there's in the Sinai Peninsula, they've been going in there and bombing and the Egyptians are working with them on that. Saudi Arabia has a, a new prince that's about to take over. His father's about to die. The guy's like 32 years old. He's very proactive. And who they're worried about, these guys are worried about these guys, Iran. And Iran is the major mover and shaker as a proxy, frankly, of Russia. And they are empowering Hezbollah and Hamas, these terrorists in these areas, to come against Israel. And also they're empowering, as Russia is, Syria. And, the real, the, and this is an amazing thing. It's all spiritual in scope of nature. If you followed what's happened in Syria in the last six or seven years, where there's been over half a million people die, I mean, it's been unbelievable what's going on there, right? And you saw those people that are scattered, you know, one or two million people that have gone into Europe and stuff like that as a result of what's happening there. That's prophetically significant as well. At the heart of it, it's all religious. What was happening in Syria is the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims. The majority of Muslims in the world are Sunni. Okay, 80% of 1.6 billion Muslims are Sunni. The rest of them are Shia. These guys are Sunnis. These guys are Shia, by the way. Until 1935, Iran was known as, do you guys know what it was called? Persia. You can see that in Ezekiel 38. But they hate each other. Sunnis and Shiites hate each other. Except for destroying Israel, they want to destroy each other. And that's what's been happening in Syria. The Bashar al-Assad, who is the leader of Syria, he is one of, he's a different kind of Muslim as the majority of his people. He's a Shiite, the majority of the people in Syria are Sunnis, and he's had a lot of these people killed. It's a civil war, but it's a war with religious context with it. That's so critical, folks. So in the last days, when we look into Ezekiel 38, Egypt, Egypt's not part of it. Saudi Arabia, which was ancient Sheba and Dedan, are not part of it. And we'll see that as we move forward in some of this stuff. So again, just look at the scope of it. This little itty-bitty place, and everybody's mad because we've said Jerusalem is the capital of Jerusalem or, or Israel. Guess what? Jerusalem has always been the place that God had reserved for his people. The Jewish people have inhabited that region for centuries and centuries, for millennia, right? And God is finishing the plans that he started with them. So when we move into this, again, here's a, an aerial shot. Folks, this is the Temple Mount. And there are two Islamic structures that are up here. And the enemy has been uh, very effective in bringing division here. So this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is the Dome of the Rock. Uh, it's amazing when you go up there and you see this. By the way, just in the last couple of weeks, the, uh, the main sheikh or imam, the guy who was over this, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem who was over the Al-Aqsa Mosque, has stated in light of what our president has said about Israel and Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. And then, that wasn't enough, right? Assuming what our president did the last two weeks was saying, hey, guess what? We're not waiting to establish our embassy in three or four or five years. Guess when it's going to happen? May 14th of this year, the exact same day of the 70th year that Israel has been established. Is there a prophetic significance? Could be. But you know what? In light of what our president has done, the whole world is upset. The Islamic world is upset. And keep in mind, folks, we love the Islamic people. We love everybody. We want everybody to know Jesus Christ, right? Jesus died for everyone. And here's an amazing thing. There have been, there have been many. Right now in Iran, back in the 70s, they estimated maybe 500 Christians. Now in Iran, there are well over a million Christians. More and more people are coming to faith in Jesus in the Islamic world. They're coming to understand who he is. Uh, remember we shared with you about Savannah Brook, who's our missionary that's in Montebaluna, Italy right now at the Calvary Chapel Bible College over there. I shared with you last week how she was just on a plane over in the Middle East. She was flying from different places. She sat between two Muslim guys, one from Syria and one from Morocco. And they started talking. She got to share the gospel with them. And they were very open, especially one guy named Muhammad from, that's a common name, right, <laughs> uh, in Syria. And so the Lord orchestrated an amazing thing. Why she's been over in Italy, there's a lot of Islamic people there. She's had a chance going to, uh, this isn't a Christian thing, she goes to a school to learn how to speak Italian. 
And so some of the Islamic people who have moved into the area are there too. She's had a chance to lead two young women who are Islamic to Jesus Christ as a result of being there. God's opening doors. Yeah, so the Lord's moving, you know. Here's the reality that God loves them, and we need to pray for them as well. But folks, this piece of real estate is so, so absolutely critical. Two weeks from today, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just prior, during that week, leading up to Resurrection Sunday, right? Jesus died on the cross three days before that. He died in a place called Golgotha, the Hill of the Skull, but he was on Mount Moriah. Guess what this Temple Mount area is called? That's Mount Moriah. You probably heard Moriah, but it's Mount Moriah. Over here, you probably can't see it. It's more towards this end of this. Back in Genesis chapter 22, that's where Abraham was instructed by God to take his son, his only son, Isaac, right? And to sacrifice him in that exact location as well. But as he was preparing to be obedient and to sacrifice his son, the angel of the Lord, that was Jesus pre-incarnated, stopped him and said that the Lord would provide himself a sacrifice. Now, in that time, he provided a sacrifice in the, in the, you know, a ram. It was in the thicket. He provided that. But the significant thing is that Jesus said he would provide himself a sacrifice. And guess what happened thousands of years later in the same location? Jesus did provide himself, literally, the sacrifice for our sins as the Lamb of God. Isn't that amazing? Folks, all of history in the past and what's going to happen in the future focus in this area, by the way. As we see the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is Islamic, and the Dome of the Rock, there is to be a third temple built on this area. They are crying out for the rebuilding of the third temple. The Jewish people want it badly. Folks, when we go to Israel, and, and you're going to be blown away, we go to the Temple Mount Institute. We see the implements that have already been made to be used in an upcoming temple, right? And they remind you time and time again, they will say to you, the, this is not a museum. This isn't for you to look at. This is stuff that's been created to be used in a new temple. Folks, the blueprints are done. They've, they've reestablished the Kohanim. Those are the priests, the Levitical priesthood. They're practicing right now. They have all the elements and implements, the menorah, the table of showbread. All that stuff is prepared for a temple. And all they need is a temple to be built. By the way, when President Trump was elected, the uh, Sanhedrin, by the way, did you know the Sanhedrin has been reconstituted? That's like the Jewish Supreme Court religiously. These guys have been in existence again for a short period of time. They called on President Trump and Vladimir Putin to come together to work together to get Israel's temple built. And they're longing for that. You're going to see something significant about that coming up. But folks, there will be a third temple built. It could be either here in this open space, and it may be where the Dome of the Rock is. Uh, personally, I believe it's going to be over here, and I'll tell you why. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. The Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque are, are important to them. And the enemy fuels that. But the bottom line is, this is where Jewish history is. This is where the first and second temples were on the Temple Mount area. That if Israel destroyed the Dome of the Rock, do you think 1.6 billion Muslims around the world would just sit idly by no. <laughs> and I'm going to share some details about some stuff in our prophecy update today about how the preparation for a worldwide Islamic army is well underway with 5 million soldiers. Israel has 160,000 standing army. Their mindset is, hey, we just got to get together and it's a piece of cake. We'll wipe them out. You know, they better study their history, right? <laughs> all those times, you know, that they were all try, people tried to wipe Israel out already and God wouldn't allow it. But folks, stage setting is well underway. But after... The, that temple is built. It's going to be in place and in play during the 70th week of Daniel, the time of the tribulation period. We know that at the three and a half year point that the Antichrist is going to walk into that temple and present himself as God and demand that the entire world worship him. And it'll be in that temple. Now when Jesus comes back at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, that seven year tribulation period, he's going to with his with his by speaking that commandment. He's the one who created the universe, right? He said, let there be. So he's going to destroy the person who's the Antichrist. Satan himself, who will be a spirit that animates the Antichrist, will be put in prison, so to speak, for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But here's the reality. Jesus will be sitting on the throne of his ancestor David on the Temple Mount in another temple during the millennial reign. And again, that's not a fairy tale. That's amazing, folks. This piece of real estate, someday, as Christians, we will be going to Israel. If you can't make it next year to that, this last trip we're having there, you'll get to go someday. <laughs> It'll be when Jesus is seated on the throne. 
Now, I want to give you some shots from a couple years ago uh, when we were there. You can see the Dome of the Rock here. Look at the size of the space here. Here is an artist's rendering of what it might look like with the temple, of course, standing next to the Dome of the Rock. And, of course, that artist's rendering, that meets the parameters and the dimensions of a temple. And over my shoulder here, again, you can see where the Dome of the Rock is. Where I'm standing would likely be the location of the third temple. And looking this way from the Dome of the Rock, again, look at the large space that's here that would certainly accommodate a third temple. And I want to, again, you can see the shot here from that angle of what it might look like to have the temple mount. And remember, I pointed this out last week, the eastern gate is over in this area. It's been sealed up for centuries. This is the Mount of Olives that runs across here. Zechariah 14 tells us that when Jesus returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation people to establish his kingdom on earth, he's literally going to come here. He will come down the Mount of Olives and there's a, there's a natural uh, fault in the Mount of Olives. And it says when he sets his feet down, it's going to split. And he's going to come across and he's going to come into the temple area. That's amazing, folks. And it's going to happen. So there's plenty of room for that temple to be built. And so here's another artist's uh, conception of what that might look like. You look at that, you glance, you go, man, is that, that looks real. And, and this too. And you glance at that and you think, man. So someday there is going to be another temple built there and that is critical part of fulfillment of prophecy. Now keep this in mind as we're talking about Jerusalem, as we're talking about Israel, through the prophet Zechariah. Again, folks, well over 2,000 years ago, God said that in the very last days, the day and age you and I are living together, that a place, a place called Jerusalem would be the focus of the world. Again, why? Why? I mean, just practically, right? Remove the religious aspect of it because, again, that's the point of it. It's spiritual in nature. Why would people be uh, so focused on this little piece of real estate? This is what God said through Zechariah to the nation of Israel. The burden of the word of the Lord, that God's burden for Israel, sharing with them this oracle, the word of Yahweh against Israel. Thus says the Lord, that's Yahweh, this means self-existent one, who stretches out the heavens. He reminds them, hey, I am Yahweh, the self-existent one. By the way, I created the entire universe. That's what it means. Shemayim, heavens, means the entire universe. I laid the foundations of the earth. This little ball of dirt <laughs> that we live on, right, compared to the entire universe. Pretty insignificant and infinitesimal, except God says he created it, and he said he's the one who forms the spirit of man within him. At conception, folks, that's when we begin to exist. At conception. We're not intelligences. We're not pre we're, we don't live out there until at the time of conception, we supernaturally, God gives us life, spirit, soul, and body. From that point forward, we're eternal. We have a spirit and a soul, and we live eternally. So he just basically reminded them, look, I'm God. I'm seated on the throne. I'm in control. Look what he says in verse 2. Behold, God says, I will make. So who's, who's basically engineering this, <laughs> in a sense, allowing this to all come place? God says, I will make this specific city called Jerusalem, Jerusalem a cup of drunken, drunkenness or intoxication to all the surrounding peoples. Remember, all the nations that share a common border with Israel want to destroy Israel. They've tried to time and time again. They're armed now like they never have been before, as is Israel, and it's all pointing to a major, major military conflict coming up. In fact, most uh, Israeli generals are saying that they will be surprised that if there's not a huge, huge military campaign sometime later this year. So God says he's going to have these people fixated and they're going to be intoxicated and they will want to lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 3 says, and it shall happen when? In that day. Not back in the day the prophecy was given, but in that day. We're seeing the stage setting for it. This is the day. In that day, it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Look at the world fixated on Jerusalem. All who would heave it away will surely get cut in pieces and receive a giant hernia. I inserted that. Compliments of Chuck Smith. I mean, yeah, Chuck Smith and Chuck Missler. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. What nations are gathered against Israel at this time? All. Folks, we are an ally of Israel, the best friend they've got, thankfully, under our new administration. Because previous administrations, especially the last one, were no friend of Israel. By the grace of God, we're a friend of Israel, and God blesses those who bless Israel, and he curses those who curse Israel. So that's a good thing, right? But here's the reality. At some point, I'm assuming 
And my conjecture is that after the rapture, the catching up of the body of Christ, there's going to be a window of time between that and the enforcement of a peace treaty between the Antichrist and Israel and some nations, right? Something's going to happen. And if the body of Christ is out of here, if the rapture's occurred, who's going to keep the nations of the earth, including America, from coming together and going after Israel? Because it's what it says. All the nations of the earth will gather against it. And again, folks, the stage setting is well underway. But keep in mind again, Genesis 12, 3, God told Abraham all the way back in Genesis, I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. By the way, the word curse there means treat with contempt. That's one way. How do the nations of the world treat Israel? With absolute contempt. The United Nations passes one thing after one thing against Israel all the time. And all the nations that hate Israel and have terrorists going in there, do they have resolutions passed against them? No. The United Nations lies and they say, remember the pictures we saw of the Temple Mount, they say there's absolutely no evidence historically that the Jewish people have any claim to the Temple Mount or Jerusalem or Israel. There's no evidence for that. That's flat out a lie. That is a, a flat lie. And that's what we're living in the day and age where evil is called good, good is called evil. There's over 100,000 uh, archaeological finds from the Temple Mount area. When we go to Israel, we go to a, a place for part of a day where we go to where we get to help excavate some of the remnants were taken out from the Temple Mount area. And why we were there last time, there were people finding things that dated back to the temple history of the time of Jesus walked the earth during that time frame, folks. There's overwhelming evidence for that. But Satan is a liar, right? And those people are under his uh, influence. They're flat out lying. But folks, someday there's going to be this situation. Remember talking about, again, where we're at in the world. Uh, and God is stirring the heart. He's moving the heart of our president. The Word of God says in Proverbs that, that he navigates, that he steers the heart of the king. And we don't have a king. Just keep that in mind. But a leader, right, in the way that God would have him to go. So this guy, President Trump, has been included by, on a coin that they minted in Israel. Uh, the Sanhedrin did this, by the way. It's a temple coin. And you notice there's Donald Trump. You can't miss the hairdo. <laughs> and this is Cyrus all the way back after Israel was in deportation to Babylon, God through Isaiah prophesied that he would use a king named Cyrus to bless Israel and to help them to go back to Israel after the captivity and reestablish their temple and reestablish their nation, folks. And interestingly enough, just a couple of weeks ago when Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, was here, he said that exact thing, that President Trump is like today's Cyrus. And they think that's very, very significant. So keep that in mind. And so on one side of the coin, you have this declaration that references uh, Cyrus. And then also you see, what? A temple. Their desire for the temple to be finished and rebuilt. So all this stuff, folks, we're going to go into, uh, into our time in Ezekiel. Now go with me to Ezekiel chapter 38. And while you're going there, let me uh, communicate this to you. If this is your first time here visiting with us, or if you're not familiar with our prophecy updates, we don't do this all the time. Typically, we're going verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Right now, we're in Matthew. After Resurrection Sunday, we'll get back into it, and we'll start in chapter 5, and we'll start going through what's called the Sermon on the Mount. But we'll do some topical stuff like prophecy updates on occasion because it's relevant. And like never before, folks, this stuff is relevant. Unless you live in a flippin' cave and you have no idea of what's going on. And it's biblically significant. We're seeing prophecy being fulfilled. What we're going to see today in Ezekiel 38, and this is just one section of Scripture, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. He said what would be happening in the last days. That never changes. What does change are the pieces of that puzzle, that prophetic puzzle. You know, for years they were out here like this, moving closer and closer together. Guess where we're at? Those pieces of the puzzle right here about to click together. That's how close things are. Jesus himself said it would be again like a woman who's pregnant and about to give birth. Those birth pangs, right ladies? Again, you know you're about ready to give birth because they've increased with intensity and frequency to the point, okay, here comes the baby. That's where we're living out. The frequency of the birth pangs. So go with me to Ezekiel 38. We're going to begin in verse 1. I just want to read these passages to you and I'm going to show you some more information relating to unfolding things in the world today with some of the key players. Russia's in the news all the time, right? By the way, have you seen what's happening with uh, the relationship between the United Kingdom, England, 
and Russia and a lot of these different nations. And keep in mind, by the way, in Syria, Russia has a, a large military presence. They're not going anywhere. Turkey has stepped in there with a large military presence. Iran has stepped in there. Those are the three key players in the Ezekiel 38 scenario that we see here, right? Keep that in mind. So we're going to focus primarily on Turkey today. But we're seeing again this, this rising antagonism between countries around the world, us and North Korea, uh, us and Russia, what's going on you know, with all these other nations. And Jesus said in Matthew 24 that in the last days, nation would rise up against nation. The word nation is ethnos. That means people group, ethnicity. And you're seeing that, right? In a day and age where people should be on that, uh, and you know, animosity between people groups and cultures is rising. It says kingdom would rise up against kingdom. Those are like Russia, Iran, Turkey. Those are actual places like that. And it said that there would be wars and rumors of wars. The word rumors is better defined as threats. What do we see in the world stage today? Uh, we've got Putin threatening other countries. We've got North Korea threatening us. We're threatening them. <laughs> it's all over the place. All these Islamic nations threatening Israel and want to destroy her. That's a part and parcel to this whole thing. By the way, what we're seeing in the world today is a convergence that's never happened before of so many different things fulfilling Bible prophecy. And that's a huge, folks. So let's join me, join me in Ezekiel 38, beginning of verse 1. I'll be teaching out of the, the New King James. You can go ahead and take it back over to the verses if you want there, Scott. Thank you. Ezekiel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, now the word of the Lord, Yahweh, came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, and a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, again in 1935, is now known as Iran. That's what Persia is. Ethiopia and Libya, those are in northern Africa. Those are Islamic nations, Kush and Put, was what they would be called back in the day and age. But they're, uh, by the way, Turkey is arming both of those places, push and cut in an amazing way. They're putting a lot of military infrastructure in there. Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> Again, more fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So Libya are with them, all with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, from the far north and all its troops, that's modern day Turkey. And many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready. You and all your companies that are gathered against you, be a guard for them after many days. So this is prophecy again, thousands of years ago. So he's saying, after many days you will be visited. In the latter days you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. In Ezekiel 36 and 37, prophecies about Israel being scattered. Again, that's what happened after the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. Then ultimately in 135 A.D., after what was called the Bar Kokhba Revolt, the Romans completely dismantled and destroyed the Jewish nation and scattered them. Israel was not a nation again, folks, for almost 2,000 years. And these prophecies talked about that scattering among the nations and being regathered in the last days. That's what Ezekiel 37 is about. And that's exactly what's happened. Isaiah prophesied Israel, nation would become... Uh, Israel become a nation again in one day. It's exactly what happened. By the way, Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 9 prophesied that Hebrew, biblical Hebrew would disappear. Guess what? After Israel was scattered, it disappeared. Biblical Hebrew was not spoken in Israel for centuries except in synagogues. And even most of those guys didn't know what they were talking about. They would just read the scrolls and stuff. But it prophesied that in the last days when Israel was regathered, the biblical Hebrew would be restored, and it has been. Today you go to Israel, they speak biblical Hebrew. Another prophecy fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? And for centuries they did not. So God, again, is talking about the people who are scattered, and they've been regathered and restored. And it talks about those who will come against them. Verse 9, you will ascend. That's Gog and Magog. That's Russia. And these nations from the north. And you can look at a map and you can see it, folks. 
You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. Remember, they have a presence now just north of Israel in Syria. Thus says the Lord God, On that day it will come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. He's talking to Gog of Mago. That's the leader. If this scenario comes to fruition in the not-too-distant future, there's a character who leads Russia right now who very much fits the description of Gog. His name is Vladimir Putin. So he's either a forerunner from the guy who's coming, or he's the guy. I'm not telling you that's the case, but he fits that. By the way, Russia, uh, you know, they're, they're rebuilding their military after the Soviet Union collapsed. They went through a lot of tough stuff, and his goal is to restore uh, Russia to major world prominence, folks. But they're a poor country right now. They've got difficulties. But Vladimir Putin himself is worth about 50 to $200 billion. He didn't care about his people. He cares about power, right? And he cares about returning Russia to their glory. But what happens is it says, On that day it shall come to pass that the thoughts will rise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I, go, I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. By the way, Israel right now considers itself to be uh, very blessed, very peaceful. I mean, within their borders, it's good. Things are well. They have one of the best militaries in the world. Again, they're one of the leading countries in technological advancements and, and in terms of, of being a world leader in so many different areas. Israel is because God has blessed them. And so even though their surrounding neighbors want to kill them, they're not worried about it. They live peacefully. They know their military capability. And so that's the case right now. And it says that Gog will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having either bars nor gates. Now look, verse 12, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited. When Israel became a nation again in 1948, so much of Israel was barren and desolate. Prophecies said that when God restored Israel, that he would make it a land that's beautiful again. That's exactly what's happened. They're one of the leading exports in the Middle East and even in Europe of vegetables and fruits and all that stuff. It's amazing to drive through Israel. Back in the 1800s, Mark Twain visited Israel and he said, this is a horrible place. I don't even know why any of these wild animals live here. This, you know what? I'm coming. It says, this is bad, <laughs> right? And so what has God done? He's restored them. Folks, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. When you go to Israel, you can actually literally go to places where you see the border of Israel and then you go into Palestinian territory of these other countries and literally at that border, it's green and lush in Israel, and it's barren and desolate right on the other side of the border. I mean, it's like, wow, right? Why? God's trying to get everybody's attention. He's told everybody in advance. He has blessed Israel. He's not done with his people. And here's the reality. These guys are in Syria right now, Russia, Iran, Turkey. And I'm uh, Just bear with me, folks. There's very important stuff here. So to take a plunder, to come against them, right? And against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, that talks about their prosperity, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan, that's Saudi Arabia. They're not going to be involved, remember I told you guys right now. They're really more like allies with Israel. They've got peaceful relationships with them. During this, they're not going to be a part of it, neither is Egypt. They're on the sidelines saying, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Folks, here's the reality. I talked about Russia being in, in pretty bad straits economically. One of the things they've got going for it is they're, they produce large amounts of oil and gas that they send over to Europe. But here's the deal. Israel has discovered, discovered large, vast fields of, of ga natural gas and oil. They're developing them, and they're making agreements to put a pipeline to go into Europe. Russia's not going to be digging that because they're already struggling. And if Europe says, we're going to buy our stuff from Israel because they're cheaper, <laughs> for one thing, do you think that's going to have uh, going to be some fallout from that with the Russians? All the stage setting, right? And they look at Israel being blessed and stuff. There's a, pr there's a provocation here that makes them hate Israel and want to come against Israel. And make no mistake, folks, bottom line is it's the enemy. Satan hates Israel. These people are pawns of the enemy because the bottom line is, is Satan doesn't want to see Jesus establish his kingdom on earth. He tried to keep him from coming as Messiah and living out that 
rescue mission and dying on the cross for our sins. He wasn't uh, effective there, so Jesus died. He was rose from the dead. He can't help that now, but he's trying to keep Jesus from coming and establish his kingdom on earth. He wants to destroy the Jewish people, always has, right? So all this stuff is in play. There's a much bigger battle beyond what we see that's this cosmic spiritual battle that's going on. Verse 14 of Ezekiel 38, Therefore, son of man, that would be Ezekiel, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, on that day, when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north. If you look at Jerusalem, you look to the north, guess where that is? Russia. Far north is Russia. By the way, all these nations that are spoken of here in Ezekiel 38 are all Islamic, except Russia, but half of the Russian army are Islamic soldiers, and that's growing. A lot of people are surprised to know that. Then you will come out of the place of the far north, and you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses. He's talking, he, he didn't know what, chair, what tanks and stuff were like back then, so he's talking in, in the vernacular of the day that he only knew. Again, you'll come out of the north. You and many peoples, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days, that's significant, that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you. O Gog, before their eyes, thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? So the question is asked, are you he? Well, because the question today, is Vladimir Putin Gog? He could be. I mean, stage setting, we're far enough along and if it's not him, it's going to be somebody in the wings, folks. But he fits that very, very clearly. And the stage thing again, with the nations being in that area. Again, we have a Russian-led coalition. Can you take me back to my PowerPoint real quick? And we're going to start to wrap things up here. Keep in mind that Ezekiel 38 and 39 talk about a Russian-led coalition of Muslim nations. We just read those passages. Magog, Rosh is Russia. Persia, Iran. Kush is Sudan. And southern Egypt, northern Ethiopia, Put is Libya, again, all Islamic except for Russia. All these nations are Islamic. Meshek, Tubal, Gomer, Beth Pagarma, those are modern day Turkey. And here's an interesting thing about Turkey it's a key player. They have, I think, the seventh largest army military in the world. They're part of NATO, we're part of NATO, but they are heavily Islamic now. Years ago, and like even the last 20 or 30 years, they were trying to become part of the European Union, and finally they got frustrated. Recep Erdogan became the leader of Turkey, and he's taken them hard right to fundamental Islamism. And he wants to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. He wants to establish a worldwide caliphate for Islam and for Allah. He believes he's the right-hand person of Allah. Folks, this is incredible. 30 or 40 years ago, that wasn't even something that was in place. But in these last days, all these key players are rising up. And you're going to see some stuff I'll show you in a minute. So you think about these key nations again. In Ezekiel 38, again, Magog. Uh, a lot of people say Magog. The Hebrew is, is Gog, Magog. Rosh, Russia, Persia, Iran. These are keys. Russia, Iran. You see all these other nations. Again, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Bethlehem, and Turkey. Those are the keys. So I'm going to bump beyond that to this map. Folks, here's the location of all those nations we just looked at. All of them. This one down here in Ethiopia. Put, Kush, Islamic. By the way, Turkey up here has been building military bases in these areas. Huge military bases. Why? Interesting. For such a time as this, probably, right? You look at Tubal, Gomer, Togarma, Meshach. That's modern-day Turkey. A lot of biblical history here, by the way, right? The, the book of Revelation, the seven letters, the seven churches are in this area. And then you go to the far north, Russia, Magog, and they all are going to come against Israel. Now, our last president, and administration left a vacuum in the Middle East. He stepped back. President Obama stepped back and allowed there to be a vacuum in which Russia stepped in, and so did Turkey, and so did Iran. Now we have a president that's in place and saying, uh, hey guys, <laughs> trying to neutralize that a little bit. Here's an interesting thing though God is sovereign again. He allowed our president just before to be a president because it facilitated. These countries be able to come into Syria, set up a major military presence, and now they're on the doorstep of Israel. And what you have down here, when you go and you look at Israel, there's this place, there's a Mon Jordan here, 
there's the Sea of Galilee. And up in here, there's a, you go into Syria, there's the border. We go there. It's an amazing thing. By the way, you can hear bombs in the distance. You can hear explosions in the distance from the warfare. It's pretty surreal. <laughs> so don't freak out, though. It's okay. None of us have ever gotten blown up yet. And, and they say it's safe because they say those guys know that if they were to try to take out some, uh, some tourists, that the Israeli army would unleash, you know what, they would open a can of whoop butt. So... <laughs> So here it is. These guys have a military presence here. They're the ones that Ezekiel said would come down from the north across the mountains into Israel. The stage is set for that, folks. And I want to share a couple things that are just absolutely uh, amazing about uh, Turkey. That's who I want to focus on before we conclude this. This is, uh, this is put out by Turkey in one of their uh, things relating to their military capabilities. Notice the crescent, right? That's Islamic. So they're heavily Islamic, and this is, this is going to blow you away. What's been happening is that I shared some articles in the first service, and I may not have time to do it, but let me just suffice to say they're headlines out of the Middle East, okay? And they're from well-known papers over there. But there is a movement to try it again to bring the Muslim nations that have the capability together to form a giant Islamic army to destroy Israel. That's their goal. And what they point out, and this is, of course, uh, a language you and I can't read, <laughs> they point out this reality that of the major nations that are involved, and this is in the billions, they spend $174 billion on their military capabilities, okay? Over here, Israel spends, spent $15 billion, their last, last count. It looks actually at the standing military. If all these Islamic nations will come together, they'll have an army of over 5 million soldiers. Israel's standing army right now, 160,000. That's significantly bigger, right? And they're thinking, gee, it's a no-brainer. Let's just all get along. Let's come together because we all hate Israel. Let's destroy her. And by the way, one point almost 7 billion Muslims worldwide in Israel today, a little over 8 million people live in Israel. To them, it's a no-brainer. Let's just all come together. And you can see that they've shown where there are military strikes that could come from, where there are bases from these Islamic countries. And again, there's little old Israel right in the middle of it. And Ezekiel prophesied over 2,000 years ago, all of this would be in play. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Are you kidding me? Remember, 27, 28% of the Bible is prophecy, God telling us in advance what would happen. Why? Because it glorifies Him. It tells people that the God of the Bible is the one true living God. He's outside of time and space. You can trust Him because He knows the end from the beginning. And He's the one who provides eternal life. He's the one who sent His Son Jesus to live a perfect sinless life, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, and to present Himself as that sacrifice on our behalf. For those of us who accepted Christ in our lives and we become children of God, right? you have to become a child of God. That means the new birth. It's because we realize who Jesus Christ is. He is God in the flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life, offered that life in our place, right on the cross. And when he rose from the grave, the new covenant is in place. If we trust him, we believe who he says he is, it says if we repent, the big religious word, right? That means simply to have a change of mind, heart, and direction. If we have that heart, we say, God, you know what? I, I understand now. Holy Spirit, you've opened my eyes to the reality of who Jesus is and what it means to have eternal life, the need for that, not to be religious, not to join Calvary Chapel or a Baptist church or a Vermont Christian church, but to know Jesus Christ. Relationship with Jesus has nothing to do with where you go to church. You need to go to a solid Bible-believing church. We're talking about relationship with God, knowing Him. That's what He came to do. And folks, when I was nine, or whoever you, you guys who know Jesus, you can probably remember that moment when you prayed and you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You said, Lord, I have a change of mind and heart. Change my heart so I can follow you. Forgive me of my sins and save me. And that moment, God honored that prayer of faith of a nine-year-old, and I became a child of God. I became a new creation in Christ, and my life changed. And you know what? For all of you who did the same thing, that happened for you too. And we're on this journey with God, right? We're different places in our relationship with Him, but He wants us to go deeper with Him every day. There's no greater relationship than the one we have with Him, to know Him, to love Him. Doesn't that blow you away? That the God of the universe, who created the entire universe, loves you so personally, He wants to spend time with you every day? That's not a religious thing. That's awesome. He loves us that most, that much. And because He's God, He can compartmentalize. He can focus His attention just on you while He's focusing His attention on millions of other believers at the same time. That's what he wants to do is to know him and to love him and to follow him, to have our hearts and lives transformed by his living word. And again, that's a relational thing, not religious thing. So we transition back into a time of worship. 
and, and seeking God's face and have the worship team come up. Folks, again, that's what it's all about, to know Jesus. If you don't know, you don't have that confident assurance. If you were to draw your last breath today, because here's the reality. None of us knows if we're going to see tomorrow. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. But if you've accepted Jesus, you know. If you become a child of God, you know when you do draw your last breath or when he comes and catches his bride up to be with him, right, that we're going to be spending eternity with him. If you don't have that assurance, you don't know today, if you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he died for your sins and was raised from the dead, you can put your faith in him, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he will honor that prayer of faith, and you'll become a child of God, and you will have eternal life. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's just too easy, right? Well, you're looking at it wrong. It's not about being easy. It's God made it uncomplicated. It's not complicated because you and I can't earn eternal life. All the good works of every person that's ever lived added up would not be, wouldn't even be a dot of what you would need to gain eternal life. We're saved by God's grace and His grace alone. It's a gift that He extends to us. That's what Jesus did. We're saved by grace. That's an unmerited gift, right? That's what God gives us. He said, look, I give you a gift of eternal life. You have a choice to accept it or to reject it. Here's the reality. The vast majority of people reject it. Unbelievable, right? And they will say, well, it's just too easy or I've got to join a church. No, Jesus wants you just to know him, to accept what he's done for you. And as we go back into a time of worship, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, you know it. And you know that you don't have eternal life. While we're worshiping right where you're at, you can pray. You can say, God, I believe. I believe what your word says. I believe that you are God. I believe you died on a cross for me. I believe you rose from the grave three days later, and I ask you to forgive me and save me. Please give me eternal life. God honors that prayer of faith. And then the journey begins. You don't do good works to get saved, but once you are a believer, God compels us to have a heart of compassion, to be his heart, his hands, and his feet, right? We do the things we do after that because we want to serve him, and we love him, and we want to love others around us. So that's where it all begins, though, folks, is to know that you have eternal life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for your loving kindness, God. We thank you for our time together in your word today. And Lord, uh, I pray that if anybody's scared today, Lord, uh, by what we see going on in the world today, God, this isn't to scare, but it's to prepare. Lord, we see the reality of these prophecies that were spoken of thousands of years ago literally being fulfilled in our day. Israel regathered as a nation. The stage setting for Ezekiel 38, also Isaiah 17. So many different things pointing to the fact that Jesus, your return is near at hand. We don't know the hour of the day, and we wouldn't even begin to try to say we know the hour of the day, God, because we don't. But your word tells us, you said that we should know, we should be aware of the times and the seasons that tell us your return is close, and Jesus, we're there. Could be today, could be tomorrow, it could be a year from now, it could be 10 years from now in your economy. Lord, help us to realize that we only have today, right here, right now. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Somebody could pull out of here this morning onto the highway and and get killed in a car wreck and step into eternity. And if they don't know you, Lord, be separated from you forever. But for all of us who know you, when our times and when they come, Lord, we know we'll just be in your very presence because we have accepted your gift of grace. So Lord, we, uh, we take a moment to quiet ourselves before you with our eyes closed and our hearts open. Just draw us to you. Speak to our heart as we just enter into a time of just uh, proclaiming your love and the fact that you reign. Lord, just to have your way even now with our eyes closed and again our hearts open to you, just have your way in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for this time and thank you for the teaching from Phil and uh, just be with us now, Lord Jesus, as we sing this final worship song and uh, just help us to lift up your name to make a joyful noise and uh, we just love you, God, and we thank you for your grace and uh, your unmerited grace, the gift that you give us. Thank you that we can't earn it and um, because, Lord, we... uh, There's no way we could earn it, so we thank you that we don't have to earn your grace, Lord, that you give it to us freely. And uh, we just thank you that we can know you and have a relationship with you. And 
just be with us now as we uh, do what you made us to do, Lord, and that's worship you and to sing your praises. We just give it all to you in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing this final song of worship? God, you reign with your 
voices, church. God, you reign. God, you reign. Lord, I know you reign forever and ever. God, you Jesus, just be Lord of our lives. Help us to seek you consistently. and Remind us, God, it's not what we bring to the table except a willing heart. You give us all that we need. You empower us by your grace and your Holy Spirit. Just help us to have willing hearts, Lord, to just love you and to follow you and to live for you all the days of our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. As he shines upon you, let him shine in and through and out of you so that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world. God bless you guys.